In the beginning, I took you through the inception of this series from the distant past, all the way back to Halo 4. Then, I took you through the more recent races that inspired it, with the Civ Hogs coming in hot to HRL and putting on a show. After that, I showed off some behind-the-scenes footage on the important work that goes into making an HRL season happen, the docks, the forging, and even the video work like Road to Indie Hog. Next up, for four straight episodes, I tried to get as much insight as possible on the process of each of the forgers for this season, starting off with myself, then Slaunch, then a Matt and Opix double feature, and capping it off with a Season 5 rivalry throwback of Detail and Roman. That takes us to this episode, number 8. To today, Friday, September 1st, 2023. 35 days since we last ran a moto, it's showtime. and welcome to the final episode of Road to Indie Hog. Even though we've covered quite a bit throughout the series, there's still a few important loose ends left to tie up before we start. The most important of these being the format of the series and the final schedule, which has seen a few tweaks since we last looked at it in episode three. On top of that, I also have prepared some fun extra content for everyone so the series goes out with a proper bang. Later in the episode, there will be a driver intro segment to hype up all of the drivers of our series, as well as some other sneak peeks for future content. Make sure to keep your eyes open for those. Hopefully this will prepare everybody for our series debut in roughly an hour. All right, first things first, let's go through the format. If you're in our Discord, you may have seen these already this week, but for those that didn't, I'm going to go through all the important rules and regulations for Indie Hog, as well as the format, and I'll also be offering some insight on why we're going with some of these as well. Most general HRL rules apply here, but we also have some new rules to talk about as well. All right, let's get started with the format. On each night, except for Triple Crown nights, we'll be doing our classic format of two heats and two motos. The heats will be roughly four to five minutes long, and the motos will be 15 minutes plus a lap. There may be some rounding done here for the ovals, since plus a lap on a minute and a half long road course isn't quite the same as plus a lap on a 30 second long oval. We will not be qualifying for this season because I think our current format of two heats and two motos doesn't really need it as much as a format that does one long race. I think there's a reason why we've stuck with this format for such a long time. It just offers the best competition and fun balance that we try to go for as a league. The lineups for heats for the first race of the season will be an invert of HRL RX's grand finals overall finishing order. After that, it will be inverted off of the previous race's overall finishing order for the rest of the season. An important one to note here, if someone doesn't have a previous result 
to go off of, they will start at the back for heats. And if there's multiple people like that, the starting order between those particular drivers will be randomized. The reason for this is I don't want there to be an incentive for you to skip a track you don't like, or honestly just miss races in general, and then benefit from it with a pole position start. That was a pretty clear flaw in our previous invert format, in my opinion, and that's why we've made the change. One more note on the format that I briefly mentioned earlier, Triple Crown Knights. Triple Crown Knights are returning for this season, and I think a fair way to do them is to have one Triple Crown Knight for each track category, and the Indy 500 as a bonus Triple Crown Knight since that race is the namesake of the series. So in total, that'll be four Triple Crown rounds for our 15 round season. We'll get into which races are the Triple Crowns in particular, and on which tracks when we go through the updated schedule. Next, we're going to go through a very important change in the season. For the last couple seasons that we've been racing hogs, we've been doing jokers on Rallycross and GP tracks in order to spice up races. I still like the jokers, but we've been doing that for roughly a year now, and I think it's time for a shake up there. Therefore, for Indy Hog, we'll be doing pits on road and street courses. Please note that they will only be on road and street courses, not ovals. More on that later. First, I'll go through how they work in these races. Just like the jokers, drivers will have to take two pits per moto. Unlike the jokers, there will be no pits in the heat races. Honestly, I think this is an improvement. The heat races were a little short and often had such a small lap count for jokers that they weren't super necessary. I kind of like having pits as a moto exclusive thing for that reason. As far as pit boxes go, they will be assigned after heat races are completed. The first place starter for moto one gets first pick, second place gets second, and we go down the line. In the motos, the pits open after two laps have been completed in the race, and they close with two laps to go. The reason for this is because all pit roads on these tracks are placed adjacent to the start finish line. So we can't really do what we'd usually do with jokers where we started allowing them on any lap. It just wouldn't work here with the pits in that location. Now, yes, that may seem to narrow the pit strategy when compared to jokers a bit, but there's something new we're doing that completely opens it up. We're going to be introducing some strategy into how pits are done. Let's break it down. To do a pit, you'll enter the pits, go for your pit stall, get at least two of your tires in your stall. If you only have one or none of them in, then it'll be a time penalty added on at the end of the race. Once you're in your stall, you exit your hog with your magnum out and you have to empty your magnum clip over the course of both of your pit stops. Now, if you're listening attentively, you may have figured out where the strategy comes into play here. Again, you have to empty your entire mag from your magnum, but over the course of both pit stops. So for the first pit, for example, you could shoot one bullet and on the last pit, you could shoot 11. The first pit, you could shoot three. Last pit, you could shoot nine, shoot six for both, whatever you want to do with some exceptions. You must shoot at least one bullet and you cannot do a stop where you shoot all of your bullets, then just exit and quickly re-enter your hog for the last stop. There has to be bullets exiting your magnum on both stops and you must get to the reload animation on your last stop. Another important point here, you do not have to complete that reload animation. You just have to shoot the last bullet and get to it. All right, now that I've explained it, if you're a real life racing fan, you may get the idea here. And in fact, I've been in other leagues way back in the reach days where we used to do something similar to this. The idea is to add in something like a real life gas and go, two tire or four tire pit stop strategy. You'll have some control over whether you want your pits to be around the same time or whether you want one to take significantly longer or be faster than the other. And this could have some benefit to your performance in the race if you nail the strategy and get back out on track at the exact right time. Hopefully this plays out in a way to make pits completely unique from jokers and maybe even have more depth to them than jokers in most situations. Let's talk about ovals. First of all, as I mentioned previously, ovals will not have pitting. To be fair, we absolutely could do pits on ovals, but after thinking about it, I look back at Hogtona, which most people agreed was a pretty fun debut for a traditional oval on the hogs, and ask myself whether the race would have been better with pits. Now, of course, it's totally conjecture and we have no way of knowing, but after thinking about it, I think that that race did absolutely fine without them, and I'm not convinced that adding them in would have made things better. In fact, separating the pack on a track like that might have even made it less interesting. This plays out a lot differently on road courses where separation tends to happen a lot quicker and is more natural anyways. On ovals, you generally want the pack to stay together as long as possible for the best racing product. Another factor to add on to this is cautions. With cautions, we could still do the strategy idea with control over how many bullets you shoot, but I think it'd be weird with cautions in play. And I could see a lot of strategies coming down to luck on when a caution comes out rather than actual good strategy plays like we would see in the GP races. Again, to be fair, that is pretty similar to how real life oval racing goes with pit strategy, but it's just not something that ovals need on Halo in my opinion with it already having the highest luck factor of the series. Yes, there's definitely good oval racers and bad oval racers, and the results tend to be pretty consistent, but you're more likely to luck your way into a win on an oval than a Supercross or GP, and I think everyone knows that. And that's fine. Not every series needs to be perfectly equal with each other in terms of competition. That's part of my reason for not going for pits too. It already has the highest luck factor. I don't think we need to throw more wood into that fire. Secondly, let's talk about cautions. Cautions will work as they always have, but I just want to clarify the rules. So cautions can be called for a single driver wreck if they dismount or fly out of the track. Otherwise, 
cautions must involve two or more drivers in the crash. Remember that two or more drivers are involved, so if someone spins on their own and no one hits them and they don't dismount or fly out of the track, it shouldn't be a caution. But if somebody spins out and then someone from behind proceeds to hit them, it is absolutely a caution. Another gray area that tends to be called either way in some cases is when somebody gets wrecked by another driver. For example, driver A goes for a big dive bomb on driver B and puts them in the wall, wrecking them. I would argue that this is a caution. Yes, I suppose driver B is technically the only driver that is wrecked, but the wording is two drivers involved and driver B would not have wrecked without a driver forcing them up, therefore it is too involved and should be a caution. I've seen a lot of these not called, especially in the past two years since we've returned in particular, and they definitely should be called. But of course, the managers are not always in a position to see every crash, so everyone should try to keep these examples in mind. Third, we have a new caution procedure on ovals to go through, and I'm pretty excited about this one. In fact, I think this will make up for the lack of strategy with no pits on ovals. In Indie Hog, we're going to be introducing a rule that is used in a variety of different oval series called many different things. I'm going to use NASCAR's terminology and refer to it as the choose rule. This is how the choose rule works. When there's a caution called, we race back to the line and then stop on the backstretch and single file in the order that we cross the line. Once everyone's on the backstretch and we have the order set, the leader will choose whether they want inside or outside for the restart. Then second place will choose, then third, and it goes all the way down the line to last place. In case you don't completely get how this works, I'm going to give an example of a way this could play out. All right, so live while I'm editing the video right now, I decided I'm going to do a real life Hot Wheels demonstration instead of going with my explanation that I had already recorded. I think this will honestly be easier to uh, to visualize here. So we have our five drivers here, all right? Driver number one, driver number two, driver number three, driver number four, driver number five. Okay, they all lined up on the back stretch. This is the order that they were in when they hit the line for the, for the caution, all right? Lined up on the back stretch, single file, and now they're going to choose their starting spot for the restart. So, Driver one is just gonna go straight up, take the inside line. Driver two, gonna do that as well. Driver three, gonna do that as well. And then driver number four makes a play call here. So sees all that track position and is like, okay, I'm gonna take that. So goes all the way up there and takes that outside line. And as you can see, with these first three drivers taking the inside, that driver that takes the outside goes all the way up to the front row. And now driver number five, if they take the outside, they will go all the way up to row number two outside, or if they take inside, then row number four inside, and it'll look like that. So there's all different types of combinations and ways this can play out, but hopefully that visualization helps it out uh, a little bit for you guys and makes a little more sense. So yeah, hopefully that helps. I'm pretty excited for this new rule as it allows for a lot of strategy in oval racing. No longer do you have to worry about what position you're in if a caution comes out and you get stuck on the bad line for a restart, because now you control your own fate and pick whichever line you prefer. And if other people get to that line before you, you could go for the least preferred line and maybe even have that pay off with some extra track position. I'm curious to see how this plays out, but I imagine it should be pretty good and maybe even make oval races a little bit smoother on restarts with people starting in the line that they'd rather be in at that moment. Fourth, it's finally time to talk about green-white checkers. We've done green-white checkers in HRL on ovals for a long time, and whether you like them or dislike them, I think everyone could agree that they could be a little bit confusing at times. They could be chaotic, they could be random, and encouraging of some questionable driving that we'd rather not encourage. The way we're going to approach fixing this in Indie Hog is by making the end of oval races a lot simpler. This may sound confusing at first because we're all used to green-white checkers at this point, but once everyone gets it down, I think it'll make more sense and actually cause less confusion at the end of oval races overall. So let's go through it. The gist of it is that it isn't a new green-white checkered procedure. Green-white checkers just aren't a thing anymore. You may ask, well, what happens when we have cautions at the end of ovals now? I'm going to try to explain two scenarios that could play out here so that it makes the most sense for everybody. Scenario number one, a caution comes out late in an oval race. We race to the line, line up on the back stretch, and when we all get lined up and get our position picked, we go green at the line, and it's exactly two to go. This is what we've referred to in the past as a natural green-white checker. There's no laps added onto the race, no overtime, we just naturally had a caution that occurred at a time for it to still be a green, then white, then checkered finish to the race. But again, without any type of overtime. These will still be ran. Again, if this scenario happens, we will run the restart until the next either checkered or caution flag ends the race. Now here's scenario number two. Scenario number two, we get a late race caution, race to the line, 
line, line up on the backstretch, pick our spots, and when we go green for the restart, it'll be one lap to go. In this scenario, we would run the last lap of the race under caution, and wherever you were at when we race to the line for the caution is where you'll finish. I'll repeat it, we do not run a one lap shootout. We do not add laps and run a green white checkered. In this scenario, the race ends under caution, no more overtime or added laps. So I'm sure what some of you are probably thinking is, isn't this a little anticlimactic? And I would say yes and no. It really depends on the state of the race. A late race caution that ends the race out of nowhere, especially once we get used to this and the field starts to recognize before they race to the line that it'll be the last lap, it cause for some crazy exciting moments in that last run to the finish line. And in a more single file race, where a green white checkered could spice things up, sure, a late race caution ending the race could be a little anticlimactic. But at this point, I'm fine with that, and I don't think it's a bad thing. Not everyone will agree, but I would make the argument at this point that GWCs generally do do more harm than good at the end of races for ovals. Not just from a racer standpoint, but from a managing standpoint as well. And even for the spectators, it can get a little ridiculous taking three tries or more to end a race. With this new system, I think more often than not, it'll be the case of the driver that either dominated most of the race or clutched up and got into a good position to win near the end of the race will be the driver to win. And I think even people that liked GWCs would agree that wasn't necessarily the case most of the time in the past. I think doing it this way will be more competitive, more fair, and once we get used to it probably more fun. Yes, the chaos of GWC finishes could be exciting, but again, it could also be a total headache and tack on some excess stress to the end of a race that was otherwise pretty fun. On top of that, referring to earlier when I was discussing the luck factor of ovals versus other types of racing, I think GWCs were another thing that massively added to that luck factor, and I think taking them away does the opposite. Again, under these new rules, whoever should win the race will win the race more often than not. It may take some time getting used to it for all of us, but we'll see how this experiment plays out, and I would wager by the end of the season that most people will agree that this is the right way to do it going forward. That does it for our oval discussion and the format discussion as a whole. If any of that was confusing to anybody and they need things cleared up, don't be afraid to bring any of that up to me during our first race night and get that question answered sooner rather than later. We definitely want everyone to know what's up with ovals when we get to those with all of these important changes, and it'd be tragic for someone to mess up on a road course pit stop and cost them some spots they otherwise would have had. So again, make sure you get any doubts you might have cleared up before we drop the green flag for heats. I've shown off the schedule in previous episodes before, but as you would expect, while the schedule looks mostly the same, it has evolved a bit since we first showed it off, and the tracks have a lot more progress on them as well, so I'm here to take you through that, and even mention whose files the tracks are on, so you can get previews yourself as early as you want on the tracks that are ready, alright? Let's get into it. Throughout most of this series, I've been hyping up St. Pete as the opener, but with the Triple Crowns being decided upon, I wanted to spread them out throughout the schedule, and I wanted the opening night and the final night in particular to be Triple Crowns. So with that being said, Long Beach is now the opener, tracked by Papa Slime if you want to get a quick preview of it before we start. Then we go to Texas Motor Speedway, a fast oval that Matt will be finishing soon, hopefully. Texas is followed by our first road course of the season, Barber Motorsports Park. This is one of my tracks, and I've previewed it a bit in the last couple episodes, but haven't really explicitly mentioned it because I was busy interviewing our guests. This one's a bit of a different take on the GPs that I tend to make. None of the corners are really the same here, and there's a lot of elevation change and banking to them, as well as long straightaways to give you loads of speed going into almost every corner. Barber is now followed by St. Pete at round number four. We're still going to be racing this track relatively early in the season, but it now has Long Beach's old spot in the schedule. When I decided I wanted Long Beach to be a Triple Crown race, I did not want it to be back-to-back -back with one of our other Triple Crowns coming up, and making the swap with St. Pete was just too easy and fitting, so I sent it on that. Round 5 is the big race, the namesake of the series, the Indy 500, another Triple Crown, our first on ovals, and this race is going to be wild. Tests of the track have been pretty fun, and I think the racing is going to be great and chaotic here. I will not be surprised if we see some huge flips during this race. Now we move on to the middle third of the schedule. 
starting off with a tour through Wisconsin with Road America at round number six. This track has been great every time we've been to it in the Hogs. It's the only track that we can say that for in the schedule since it's the only one that we've actually raced before. I have no doubt this track will put on a show again. After Road America, we go south a ways to the Milwaukee Mile. I wasn't 100% sure on my rendition of this track initially, but I've put a lot of work into updating it and I really like what I have now. And funnily enough, this track got raced in the NASCAR Truck Series for the first time in over a decade recently, and the way my version of it races honestly looks pretty similar to how it was working for them, so I'm definitely proud of that as well. Round number eight is a special one, not only because it's Roman's first track in the schedule, because it's the only track in the schedule that is a fantasy track. All of the other ones have some real life roots, and yes, this one may have some inspiration there in the way that it's forged as well, but it's completely from the mind of Roman as we discussed in his interview. The track is unique in that it's a roval, and it raced pretty well in testing. Definitely looking forward to Lafayette. After that, it's Halloween week, and we'll be racing mid-Ohio here, a co-forge by Detail and myself that is still in production. This track has lots of cool elevation changes in the corners that if executed properly is going to make for some super tricky sections in the hogs. I'm really curious to see how it turns out. And final track for the middle of the schedule, Iowa Speedway. Opix's first oval to enter the mix and our third triple crown on the season, which is fitting since they actually race a double header here in real life as well. So those drivers see some extra racing on this track too. Now it's time for the final third of the schedule, starting with Portland GP, a track by myself that has actually been done for quite a long time. We tested this in the past during the RX season and it was a hit there, so this might be one of my most anticipated races for the season. Too bad that we have to wait all the way till November for it. Following Portland is Pocono, another massive speedway oval on the schedule, and this will be Opix's second track. Very curious to see how he approaches this one, as it's one of the most unique ovals in real life. After Pocono and entering the month of December, we'll race the Toronto Street Course, Roman's second track on the schedule. Roman definitely brings his own forge style to all the tracks that he makes, even the real life ones, and I think he's going to bring that here for Toronto. Making our three street courses in the schedule made by three different forgers all feel very unique. Now we head over to Gateway, the penultimate round of the season, and the oval track by Slaunch. Yes, you heard that correctly. Slaunch finally gave ovals another shot, and I think he did a pretty good job at that with Gateway. We did some testing here, and the balance honestly seems great. The inside and outside lines on both turns have their own merits and speed to be gained from them, and I think the racing here will be absolutely spectacular because of that. And now it's December 15th, and we're finally in the last round of the season at Laguna Seca. A triple crown on the track made by Detail. Of course, we just had Detail in the last episode, and we discussed this track and showed a lot of preview footage of it, and I've got to say, it's still early, but this is going to be a good one, and it'll be very fitting to end the season on it as well. The track has a great flow to it, the corners are not easy to hit properly, and there should be plenty of passing and battle opportunities here as well as opportunities to gain time. I genuinely think the racing is going to be great on it. I hope that showing off the updated schedule was informative with the changes made, and now showing the lap counts as well for the tracks that are currently complete. I tried to make it a point to mention who forged each of them as well, so you know where to go to find these if you want to check any of the finished tracks out, and if you're someone that's working on a track that is not done yet, please post an update to the Discord when you do finish it so we can all check it out. Well, with the format, rule changes, and schedule now showcased to all of you, now it's finally time for an awesome segment that I've had planned from the beginning for this episode. Let's get into the driver intros for our Indie Hog season. Everyone get up and get hyped for the HRL 2023 Indy Hog Series Driver Intros. First up, a longtime racer making a recent return. Everyone loves him for his camera roll. It's the number 48, Coop. Coop's favorite HRL season was Halo 5 Season 5, and his favorite race was our recent Firestone Firehog Albert Park, where he scored a podium. Coop's favorite quote was from myself. So Coop, did you consume illegal substances for graduation? Following Coop, we have a driver that didn't make an RX race, 
And I don't even know if he'll make one this season, but he filled out the form, so make some noise for D Mills! D Mills is known best for winning H5 Season 6, and of course that was his favorite HRL season. And his favorite race was Barbo from that season as well. D Mills' quote is actually from Carmelo Anthony. People look at me like I'm on my way out of the game. I'm just getting started. Next up, finishing 11th in HRL RX, it's the Toot Dime World of Outlaw Champion, number 13. Everyone give it up for Matty Mopar! Matt's favorite HRL season was World of Outlaw Season 1, where he took his first championship. And his favorite HRL race was our recent running of Pop Tona. Matt's favorite quote actually comes from famed NASCAR commentator Larry McReynolds. Brad Keselowski won this race. Coming in at 10th place in HRL RX, it's everyone's favorite white guy that doesn't sound white. Number 223, Armada. Armada's favorite HRL season was World of Outlaw Season 4, and he didn't fill out the damn form, so for favorite race, we're gonna go with his recent Hogtona overall win. I bet I'm right, I bet that's it. And since he didn't fill out the form, my favorite Armada quote is, I've only had Marcos, Ginos, Vitos, Bambinos. It's time for our ninth place finisher in RX. This driver is known for absolutely holding down the fort with the docks. Number 81, Opix Sonic. Opix's favorite HRL season was Halo 5 Season 5, and his favorite HRL race was Mirabilis from that season, where he took a huge moto win. Eighth place in RX belongs to someone that we have yet to hear. What does he sound like? Is he actually from Canada? Is he even a he? Let's hear it for Camby! Camby is a Barvo winner. He was also an absolute force in the first oval season, and he had a great run in our recent Halo 3 tier S night. We're gonna have to travel across the pond to announce our seventh place RX finisher. It's the driver with a super consistent yellow and red colors. Make some noise for Hunter! Hunter's favorite HRL season was H5 Season 4, and his favorite race took place in that season. An underrated pick, I might add, London Arena Cross. Hunter's favorite quote is... Chocolate? Can, can I explain that? No? Okay, should, should we cut that out? I really think we should cut that out. We stay across the pond for our next driver, just missing out on the top five at sixth place in RX. This one can never get enough room, especially from BT. It's Vulcan! Vulcan's favorite HRL season was Oval Season 2, and his favorite race was Yarnum in our recent RX season. A very, very new pick. Vulcan's favorite quote? Get fucked, Roman. Pride Month blows. I'm straight. I would like to add at the end of this intro that the quote was for comedic purposes. The HRL is an ally. Funnily enough, that last quote segues nicely into our next driver, who had a late clutch up to take fifth place in RX. Everyone knows him, everyone loves him, but no, we don't want to see his new Supercross. Get turned for Roman! Roman's favorite HRL season was H5 Season 5, and his favorite race was Mirabilla Season 5, where he finally had to come to grips with the fact that he'd lost the championship. See, Roman? This is what happens when you don't fill out the damn four! Fourth place in RX belongs to our last driver not from the United States. He's had many strong runs in the Hogs and loves Monza. It's Soul Reaper! Soul is another non-form-filling enjoyer, so I'm just gonna say that Firestone Firehog was his favorite season, and Monza in that season was his favorite race because he got a strong win there. Now it's time for our podium finishers from RX, the big dogs, the first of which is a new dad and longtime HRL veteran. You already know who it is. It's the number 343 three, Papa Slaunch. Slaunch's favorite HRL season was our recent Firestone Firehawk season three, where he ran a split of hogs and H4 mongooses on old tracks. His favorite race was H5 season four Salt Lake SX because of some epic battles between him, Luke, and Pancake. However, he also mentioned his near sweep of Everglades swaps in Firestone Firehawk Season 3, where the fourth moto just didn't go his way. Slaunch's favorite quote is actually one of his own. Yurgle those triples would give an asexual a bond. We 
move on to the runner-up from RX. He's taken over 150 moto wins in HRL, the second most all-time. And now with the last couple of years, he's added a few more championships onto his belt as well. It's the black and pink Spartan with a killer voice. Make some noise for number two, Detail. Detail's favorite season was World of Outlaw Season 4, where him and Luke had an epic battle that lasted the entire season. Coming down to Detail, clutching up by one point in the last night, but Luke got his chip as well in the grand final by taking that by one point over Detail. Possibly the only time this type of scenario has ever happened in HRL. Maybe the only time it will happen. His favorite race was in TRS Season 6 on Amazon 1, a track famed for being the place where Justin Baker claimed his first victory. But in 2022, our rerunning of it was an absolute banger of a race that put on a great show for the fans. Detail's favorite quote is one of his own. Imagine being high with a breakfast crunch wrap with your boys. Brick Duck 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 Duck. And now we have one driver remaining. It's the HRLRX regular season champion, the number 33, Luke. Luke's favorite HRL season is H5 season 3 for being the one that kicked off the most memorable run of our league and essentially being the pioneer of so many aspects of HRL. His favorite race is H5 season 1 Mirabilis, the one that started it all, that had one of the most epic four-way battles in all of HRL between himself, Detail, Slaunch, and Armada. Luke's favorite quote is one of his own. I'm not by, but if Clad was here right now, I'd smack his ass. And that's it for this series. It's been a fast two months, and we're now minutes away from starting up the season that we've been hyping up this whole time. At this point, all I have left to say is good luck, have fun, and make it one to remember. All right, all right, all right. Gentlemen!